Malcolm McIver here to the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Um, I, we occasionally host um, scientists here, scientists and engineers that are traveling through or coming to New Zealand for other reasons, but this was the first time that I saw an email from the, the U.S. Embassy arranging his visit. So I thought, oh, this is, this is kind of fun. Um, so Malcolm was here on the South Island um, for the New Zealand Science Festival. Science yeah. Festival. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, had some time here in Auckland before he flew out. And so he um, generously decided to come by. Um, so Malcolm is a, a scientist and engineer, um, professor of bioengineering at Northwestern mm -hmm. in, uh, in Illinois in the US, just outside of Chicago. Um, and um, I, I printed this out. He's actually got quite a lot of honors and awards and lots of um, publications. Um, of note, he won the 2009 Presidential Early Career Award for Science, um, and I think the same year an NSF Career Award mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so he has a PhD in um, neuroscience. He did some work, uh, a PhD work in cognitive science as well. Um, has a pretty interesting um, story of how he got into science and, and the path that he took. Um, so I won't go into that, maybe he'll, he'll share it with us. Um, but I thought another pretty interesting thing about um, Professor McIver's work is that um, he he's spends some of his free time consulting with sci-fi sci shows and movies um, to make sure that the work that they're putting out there is scientifically relevant. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and so anyway, without further ado, yeah. uh, he's going to pre present his work on um, optimal movement strategies and, and information harvesting. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for packing in uh, to, to hear my talk. I've really enjoyed being in New Zealand. I, I now have uh, a country I, I, I think I might want to visit for a longer period of time at some point. <laughs> it's, it's been really extraordinary uh, just, just uh, visiting and getting to know the people. I'm going to tell you about two uh, different bits of work. Um, one is a slightly older work on optimal movement, uh, where we're looking at understanding what it means to say a, a movement is optimal and how we actually show that it is. And the other um, is uh, a whole bunch of, or at least tries to summarize work that we've done recently on understanding what an optimal way to acquire information by moving the body amounts to. So I'm going to try to do both of those things. So. I apologize in advance if this is uh, stuffed more than a Chicago deep dish pizza uh, in terms of content, and I'll try to um, uh, not be skip around too much. But if you see a gap in logic, please raise your hand, and, and uh, I hope I can explain the gap. So over, over lunch, we're having a really nice uh, discussion about uh, what does a, a person who maybe doesn't s still have religious belief do in terms of getting that sense of uh, some of the awe that you get with, with religion. And for me, it's uh, things like deep space. Here's a picture of uh, the Hubble from, uh, called the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. It's essentially if you expose a millimeter by a millimeter uh, aperture that's at an arm's length for uh, a long period of time, 23 days exposure over 10 years is what Hubble did for this image. You get this image. It's 500. 5,500 galaxies, each one of which has about 100 billion stars in them. So that, that's pretty awesome. That's, that's something that is one of the components that makes me want to get up and do science every day. And another thing that's deep space is deep time. And here is um, fossils from 550 million years ago of uh, the first recorded predatory events uh, in the fossil record. Uh, this is, these are really tiny shell shells. Uh, they're metazoans, but they're kind of uh, they're these sponge-like creatures, and they have uh, these uh, tens of millimeter boreholes in them. And uh, this is thought to be the very first example of predatory events. And shortly after was the Cambrian explosion, which gave us all the lineages of animals that we now have. So deep time, deep space, deep time. These are great sources of inspiration to me. And what I really like to do is think about kind of the synthesis of those two things, which is to ask the question, you know, the, if you tessellate the sky with this, is, there's 32 million of those um, Hubble Extreme Deep Field images around us, and each one of which has 5,500 galaxies, so that's how big the universe is. How many times did we have something like Claudina appear uh, on some distant planet in some distant galaxy? I expect much more likely than we currently know, but who knows? 
So um, Darwin touched on this question of, in a, in a certain sense, and he said, we can clearly understand why analogical or adaptive character, although of the utmost importance to the welfare of the being, are almost valueless to the systematist. For animals belonging to two most distinct lines of descent may readily become adapted to similar conditions and thus assume a close external resemblance. So he's talking about something that is now referred to as convergent evolution, which is two different lineages of animals evolving the same structures. And um, Stephen Jay Gould in 89 in this nice book called Wonderful Life gave the example that um, some of you may not get, but this is a, called a cassette tape. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he asked the question, if you were to rewind the, the tape of life back to the beginning of life, and play it forward again, play evolution forward again, would we end up with similar or different forms, was his question, was Stephen Jay Gould's question. And so this has been a bit of a de debate amongst evolutionary biologists and theorists, is would we, uh, would we get animals similar to what we have now, or we get something very different? And so this comes to the following example of convergent evolution, which is bat wings, mammals, birds, avians and, and insects, you know, birds, uh, bats and birds and, and insects don't have an an, a common ancestor which flew, and yet they've uh, developed similar structures. So this is thought to tell us something about the physical constraints of what, it, what you have to do with a body in order to move, right? So take a look at this. This is an animal that is a Persian carpet flatworm way off quite distant from us phylogenetically, uh, and they're undulating in this certain special way. And so are squid, undulating in a certain special way, also phylogenetically distant. Here's a, the longest uh, vertebrate in the ocean. These are called oarfish. And here's an example of an oarfish, also undulating. Uh, so that the, these animals, if you trace back their phylogeny, don't have an undulatory swimmer as a common ancestor. They're incredibly beautiful. Uh, and here's the system I've concerned myself for 20 years. These are knife fish from the Amazon. They hunt in the, in the night and they undulate this fin going forward and backward and you look at them in tanks, it's, it's kind of amazing. I show people, the, you know, the, take them into the, the fish room and they look at these fish darting around and at some point, sometimes a person will say to me, which end is the head? <laughs> because they're so omnidirectional, you really can't tell. And it was in fact, their omnidirectionality that cued uh, the original person who discovered electroreception in organisms, uh, which was Hans Lissmann, um, he was at the uh, at the zoo, essentially, in, in London, and noticed one, one of the electric fish swimming backwards and not hitting any obstacles in its environment. He said, well, how could that be? And tube amplifiers had been invented recently, and so he managed to get one of these fish and discovered they have an electric field around their body, and they're actually using a radar system to avoid getting clobbered. So I got interested in the mechanics of this and did a bunch of work. Um, the people that I did it with, mostly in this talk, is Chen Chen, Isaac Nevelin, and uh, some roboticists, um, Todd Murphy and Kevin Lynch, and some collaborators from Johns Hopkins, Noah Cowan and Eric Fortune. Uh, and uh, in the computational fluid dynamics space, I've worked a lot with uh, a colleague at Northwestern, Nilish Patankar and uh, many students that we've uh, co-mentored, and a number of funders. And so back to this. So there's 100 fin rays here, each of which has six different muscles actuating the fin ray. So that's 600 degrees of freedom. No problem, right? Um, well, it is a problem. Uh, you know, three degrees of freedom is complicated. Ribbon fins are 200 times more complicated than something complicated. Uh, so I get to uh, a, a quote which I, I like very much from John Pierce, where he says, I will, however, maintain that we can learn at least two things from the history of science. One of these is that many of the most general and powerful discoveries of science have arisen not through the study of phenomena as they occur in nature, 
but rather through the study of phenomena in engineered devices. And this is because the phenomena in engineered machines are simplified and ordered in comparison with, the, with those occurring naturally, and it is these simplified phenomena that we understand most easily. And this has happened time and time again in the history of science. In fact, thermodynamics arose as a result of the heat engine being invented and people trying to calculate what was going on with the heat engine. Uh, with respect to, um, if, we, if we imagine uh, Tom Cruise as a sort of hubristic, naive, eager humanity, and uh, Jack Nicholson as sort of the grumpy nature, then I think the following film clip kind of captures what we're talking about. Uh-oh. You know, I turned... There we go. Truth. That's what nature tells me every day in the laboratory, <laughs> that I can't handle truth. I think it's basically right. So what I do is I try to study robots uh, that are approximates, approximations of, of my creature. And here's one of them. This is a 32 independent degrees of freedom robot that we built some years ago. It's about this big. <clears throat> and what's nice about it is that we could play any kind of traveling wave we want along it and measure forces and measure the flows and characterize the, the heck out of it. And we've reduced those 600 degrees of freedom to three, which is approximating something I can start to get my mind around. Um, and, oh, here's a, here's a nice uh, glamour shot with some chopsticks for Robi, robot sushi lovers for sense of scale. And so the experiments we've done have been in two different forms. One is these, the robots hanging off an air bearing platform on ceramic bearings that are pressurized so it's, got, it's frictionless. And in one mode, we have a flow, an ambient flow, and we play it, uh, a pattern on the fin and we match the speed of the flow. So we can look at swim, swim speed versus the frequency of undulation versus the amplitude of undulation versus the number of undulations. So we call it the free swimming prep. And then in the stationary prep, we can't get forces out of the free swimming prep, but if we put the water to be still and we put a force sensor here and then do the same thing on the fin, we can measure the forces at this point. So that way we get really precise measurements of force production as a function of those parameters. So those are the two experimental modes for the robot. And we also muck with the pitch, though I didn't mention that yet. Uh, I won't talk about PIV this time, but this is um, some computational fluids we've done. And the important thing to see here is this is surge force, which means a force parallel to the fin. And this force here, uh, the black line, is heave force, which is perpendicular to the fin. And as the fin is um, convecting fluid down, we get a pretty decent sized surge force. But uh, interestingly, we get a non-zero heave force as well. So the, the body's trying to push itself up because it's, if you take a cross section of the fin like that, it's essentially doing this and spitting fluid downward. So we've done a lot of work. This, these are free swimming simulations now looking at the, um, the essentially the CFD side of things and looking at how vortices uh, form and shed off of the ribbon fin. Interestingly, one of the things you might have noticed is that there's those two forces, the vector combination occurs at about 10 degrees, which is exactly the angle of all, that all these species, there's 170 of them, but I've pictured for you a few from South America, they're all at 10 degrees. So they're doing the vector sum, essentially, of those, the surge and the heave forces to maximize forward force. And interesting, there's a, a fish uh, from Africa that is also electric, has on no common ancestor that is electric. They've evolved this on their own, as it were, but it's decided to put the fin on top rather than the bottom, and that's at 10 degrees as well. This is kind of a cool control. All right, so we measured a bunch of forces versus, we measured the speed of the, of the robot in the free swimming prep version as a function of the number of undulations we play along the fin. And we did the same thing in the simulation case but the simulation case is a fin that's much smaller. It approaches the actual fin size that the fish uses. And we looked at the force as a function of the number of undulations. Uh, speed is yellow, sorry, and the force is white for the two cases. So force is on the y-axis here. 
and there's a peak at around two undulations. That's typically what we see the animal use in the, in the laboratory as they're swimming around, is around two undulations on the fin, two complete cycles, if you will, um, if you think of it as a sinusoid. Uh, and we started to inquire what was going on there, and one of the things we talk about for the coming slides is specific wavelengths, which is simply the wavelength lambda divided by the amplitude. Okay? So here's some specific wavelengths when it's really corrugated like that. It's a low specific wavelength, and as you get shallower and shallower, approaching a flat plate, you get to a high specific wavelength. And so we uh, started doing something to the robot that I wouldn't want to do to fish, which is we started to clip the fin to make it shorter and re-ran the experiments and just measured the forces and, and speeds again. This is actually showing you forces. Uh, so we tried different length fins, we tried different length numbers of undulations, and we found that as we went to, um, from the original length, which was 32 centimeter, the, the uncut length, to shorter wavelengths, the number of undulations at which the force peaked was no longer two. So that tells you we, you know, we need to find some different lens through which to look at this to see where there's an invariance. And it turns out the invariance is at specific wavelengths, uh, which is this lambda over amplitude thing. And it turns out to be 20 um, for whatever reason. But once you uh, look at specific wavelength, the peaks all collapse to the same point. And so why is that? We have a, a lot of numerical arguments for it in, in the published results, but I'll just give you the intuition because there's a lot of other stuff coming up. So there are two mechanisms at play. One is the velocity of the traveling wave. And that is, you can calculate that as frequency times lambda. Okay? So as you get to larger lambdas, the traveling wave is going faster and faster. So whatever fluid particles are getting trapped by the fin go faster and faster as you increase lambda. But the problem is, is that, and that's the other mechanism we call the friction mechanism, that as you get to shallower and shallower amplitudes to get faster wave propagation speeds, you trap fewer and fewer particles. Whereas if you go to more corrugated or lower uh, traveling wave velocity, you're trapping more fluid. Okay? So there's a trade-off here. You can either maximize the friction mechanism or you can maximize the wave velocity uh, mechanism. But the force, which is going to be the flux of mass here, is actually somewhere in between those two extremes. And it turns out that 20 is where these things are maximized. So you get the most force when you go to specific wavelength, wavelength of 20. These are some detailed arguments I won't go into. But what we did was after we found that result, we said, well, we did this for the electric fish, and it's all based on electric fish kinematics. But if it's true, it ought not to be restricted to electric fish. It ought to be any rib ribbon fin creature. Turns out there's a fair number of them. Uh, so we started here, but we went and we were able to find, amazingly enough, kinematic data for all these other animals. They all lined up quite nicely. Here's specific wavelength, and here's where all the published data is, right around 20. And keep in mind, common ancestors of these creatures did not have an undulatory fin. They used their tail. This is indicated by the fossil record. So all these different animals, you know, we, the wing example that I gave you earlier, the bat wing and, and insect wing, is an example of morphological convergence. This is an example of structural and behavioral convergence, or kinematic convergence, where the same kinematic program has been invented or discovered by all these different branches of evolution, of the evolutionary tree. And so why, what, what is really going into that? Well, take a look at this. This is specific wavelength and the thrust decrease in percentage as you go off the peak at 20. Um, one, one is the simulation variation, the other is experimental variation, but they're basically the same curve. And where we saw all the natural variation is within this green block. So across all those different species, they do vary a little bit, but it's all within this fairly narrow band around 20. 
But they don't go outside of that. And you think about it, it kind of makes sense. You know, an animal's making these undulations its entire life. If it does something a little bit more costly, it's going to have to eat that much more food, right? And since it's doing this every moment, it's, that's a lot of food probably. So we, we predict that this is really the, the basis is the energetic cost of going off the optimal peak or the peak area of specific wavelength. All right, so what this is telling us then is that in as much as other planets have fluid, uh, in as much as our planet has fluid, if you re rewind the tape of life and we play it forward, it's pretty likely we're going to find ribbon fin creatures with a specific wavelength of 20. It comes straight out of the physics of fluids. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, I'm going to switch gears because I'm going to start talking to you about optimal sensing. Then I'll come back <coughs> and talk about how optimal sensing fits with that result. So this is, this is some water, which I will drink. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is the field of an electric fish measured by a, a colleague of mine. And there's a virtual probe in the field. So a voltage probe with respect to a distant ground is going to trace out the uh, electric field oscillation. So that's one cycle. And it's happening for this species 911 times a second, that electric field oscillation. And I'm flattening a lot of the structure here. There's a lot of cool structure, like it rotates. Oh, it rotates during an oscillation, but I'm just giving you magnitude. There's all kinds of really interesting structure here I don't have time to go to, into. But essentially, here's how electrosense works. If I put an object like this dot here, if that dot has different conductivity than the surrounding fluid, then what happens is that the current coming out of the animal in the proximal patch of skin is affected. Let's suppose it's more resistant, that this is more resistive. What that does is that the part of the current um, field that is going through that object will start to get diffused and will go around. That will result in a decrease in current on the skin. And that decrease in current, because of Ohm's law equals I times R, results in a small decrease in voltage. And we can calculate what that voltage is for various targets. The typical, a typical value uh, is uh, for, for prey that are detected is around a microvolt on a baseline of a millivolt. So this is a super, super small distortion on a very small weak field. So you're not going to get zapped by putting your hand there. Everybody thinks of electric eels. I constantly have to say this is a weakly electric fish. Because strongly electric fish is what people will think of if I, if I don't say weakly electric. But these are very weak electric fields. So uh, there is an issue. Uh, we wanted to understand how precisely this works. And once again, because I can't handle the truth, I decided to build a robot, uh, which is a big simplification of this. And in this robot, we have an electric field being generated by uh, two poles, and there's a bunch of metal sensors, and they are doing signal processing, processing which is essentially, uh, it's basically a locking amplifier, which is very similar to what we think the actual fish is doing, which is essentially matching uh, the emitted field and the detected field and making sure it, it only picks up what the emitted field is. And we devise this robot to essentially we wanted a device that would go through this maze without programming. So we'd just basically we'd say, find a way through the path through the maze, but we don't tell it what the path is. Uh, and, and we do it based on the field distortion. And so this is what this looks like. So the, the little VU meters on the left and right show the total field distortion that it's picking up and using to steer uh, via a motor that is um, sticking on the, this part of the apparatus. But we're not telling it anything about where the path is. In fact, you could move these pylons as you, as you do this experiment. And this is kind of cool. Uh, we, uh, we subsequently learned we were doing this for basic science reasons, but apparently, 
there's not good non-visual sensors in underwater robots currently that can work at very near range. Um, ultra shortwave uh, sonar has a lot of backscatter uh, problems when you have short range like this. My favorite um, way of doing the experiment is to use this high-tech device called a flower sifter and put dirt into the tank and then you can, uh, this is the Amazon mode. Uh, uh. So this is uh, you know, almost like the Amazon, what the fish do, except they do this in complete darkness, so not even, not even this much in the way of light. So of course, it makes no difference. So here's the thing is that uh, for electric organisms, the, they are emitting an electric field that is dipolar in nature. And there's one over r squared reduction in strength as it propagates out, as the electric field uh, 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 goes out. And then you induce a dipole in the thing that you're trying to sense. And then that dipole falls off as the square of the distance. So you get fourth power, power, uh, fourth power loss. So if you just double the distance to your target, you're getting 1 16th of the total energy, which happens to be, if you have that, you think of the sensation you have when you put a strong fridge magnet on the fridge, that is that level of drop off, roughly quartic with distance. So sensory energy is coming in with that kind of drop off. You better be able to control your position precisely because your perceptual acuity is going to depend on, on having the correct distance to objects and controlling that flow really well. And it turns out these fish do a pretty good job. So here's a, a movie from uh, Noah Cowan and Eric Fortune. These animals tend to like to stay in plastic tubes during the day because they like to hide from predators and, and other things. They like to be in the dark. So they do a darn good job of tracking um, the thing that they're hiding in. Very precise tracking. How do they do it? Well, we got a clue some years ago when we were looking at a ventral view of the fish. And we noticed that they don't have one traveling wave. They have a traveling wave going that way and a traveling wave going that way. And this is a video from Cowan and Fortune where, from a publication we did together. It's a bit uh, start, start and stop. That's not what the actual fish does. But it's continuous. But you can see two different traveling waves that meet in the middle, roughly around there. We call that point where they meet the nodal point. And we wondered why in the world would, that's kind of like, it's kind of like you know, what you do when you're putting a thumbtack in one particular spot. You co-contract your extensors and flexors, so you're fighting yourself in a way. We wanted to know why are these guys fighting themselves? Why don't you just put you know, one traveling wave along the body and then reverse the traveling wave or you know, some other way of doing it? Why waste this energy of taking all the force that you're generating with each traveling wave and colliding the, that force and basically nulling it? So we started to inquire into that. And it turns out that they generally use two counterpropagating waves rather than one. And what they do, here's still water, and the nodal point is right in the middle of the fin. So we call it delta L, so no flow. And what they do when they, they have to actually match some forward speed, speed is they just shift that nodal point down so that a little bit more of their fin that's generating the forward force is longer than the force that from the retarding part of the fin. And similarly, when they want to go the other direction, they shift the nodal point forward. So now the traveling wave generating force to push the animal um, backward is longer. Or forward, I should say. I get, I'm getting my signs reversed. But you, you get the idea. So instead of using single traveling waves, they're, they're shifting their nodal point around. And so we, we did that trick with our robot. Well, the first trick we did was um, looking at what happens fluid dynamically when you have two inward counterpropagating waves. And it's really cool. We, our jaws dropped when we first saw this um, in the lab. It's like an inverted mushroom cloud. So it's, it's just a, a beautiful thing. This animal is completely nulling the translational force to get a force vector in one direction, which is up. <laughs> 
we have it tethered so it can't push itself up. But um, we looked at what, with the robot, we looked at as we move the nodal point, how does the velocity in one direction change? And it's really quite nicely linear, which is unusual because we knew that the thrust function for this ribbon fin is actually a nonlinear function. So how could you get a linear change in velocity with um, your nodal point shift? And um, I won't give the argument here, but basically there are these quadratic terms for both, for, for both traveling waves, and those quadratic terms null out. And basically, you're left with a linear equation, which, as a function of nodal point displacement, gives you a forward or backward force vector. So it's really nice in terms of control. So whereas in a single, tra single traveling wave, uh, the force, as a function of the number of the frequency with which you oscillate that traveling wave, has a null point. What people who like to think a lot about actuators call a dead band. So right at this point, as you change your control input, you're getting very little change. And that causes control problems, especially if you're trying to do low velocity and especially if you're trying to do lots of direction changes. On the other hand, when you do two inward counterpropagating waves, there's no dead band around zero. It's a nice linear function there. OK, so we uh, decided to try it out. We played, I think, a sinusoidal trajectory and then a square wave trajectory that the robot had to follow. And you can see what it does. And it's a really, it does really precise. This is, I think, the, the, this is the square wave. Okay. And then I think we shift to the sinusoid. But the total tracking error, yeah, this is the sinusoid now. The total tracking error is on the order of a millimeter or two. So we're getting, really, for underwater robot this size, we're getting remarkably good performance. So let's look at um, the following uh, set of images, which is we wanted to look at how does this robot track a trajectory, a small trajectory, a small amplitude trajectory, as a function of changing the nodal point. And the blue is the actual trajectory of the robot. The black is the uh, program trajectory. So it's following along quite faithfully. Whereas when we use a single traveling wave, we get pretty much the same. <laughs> so either way, we get pretty good performance out of this in terms of tracking. But this is a single traveling wave. This is two traveling waves. But if you look at the control signals going to the robot, it's a very different picture. So here's the change in the nodal point that's commanded to maintain the trajectory. And here's a change in the frequency that's commanded on that single traveling wave. And you can see it's, it's very jittery on the, on the frequency side. Again, a control issue. And we can actually quantify the cost of control for these two cases. And this is the ratio of the cost for frequency control versus nodal control as a function of the amplitude of the movement we're commanding. And so at low amplitudes, the nodal point control is a fifth. So uh, the frequency control takes five times more energy, more control effort, I should say, than the nodal point control. So there's a payoff for the organism here in terms of having to send less in the way of neural control signals we expect if this is capturing the essence of the two control regimes. All right, so now. That's a bit on um, controlled movement stuff. Now back to sensing. So this is a classic picture from Yarbis. Some of you might have uh, seen before. And this is how a human saccades around this picture. And these points here are called fixations, where, they, where the eye stops. And here's. Here, take, a, take a look at this red dot. Everybody focus on this red dot for 20 seconds and see if you can see one of the reasons we jiggle our eyes. Just focus on the red dot. Do you see the effect? Mm -hmm. So that ring disappears, right? Yeah. So what happens is your photoreceptors rapidly adapt. So one of the reasons we move our eyes but not the reasons for the big eye movements. It turns out if you actually look at one of these places where we saccade to, 
where we fixate to and we look, we zoom in on the motion, we're constantly jittering our eyes. Those are called fixational eye movements and they're ubiquitous. So our eyes are never still. And so Troxler's effect is one of the reasons photoreceptor adaptation. So we need to jiggle our sensors to get new data and to have things not adapt. But uh, I like to use this demo. Take a look at this dot for 30 seconds. And then I want you to saccade over. So let's just focus on the white dot, and I'll cue you to when to saccade over to the black dot. Okay, now look at the black dot at the center and just hold fixation at that black dot. Do you notice anything? It's that, that grid, the after image, is wiggling around, right? So that is, those are your micro saccades. That is what we're, you're observing there. You normally suppress so your nervous system can't sense them or has filtered them out, I should say. They're ubiquitous. And here's a close-up. Here's a photoreceptor mosaic on your retina, and here are some of those micro saccades happening uh, over top of them, the mosaic. Turns out, if you don't have eye movements, you do it with your head. So here's a patient who couldn't use, move their eyes. And here, here's the same task with uh, a person who has eye movements and a person who has no eye movements, and we're looking at where their gaze is uh, fixated on as they make tea. This is from Michael Land. And you pretty much can't tell the difference. There are some subtle differences, but the person with no eye movements moves their head to get the same kind of positional change of their eye. So there's a lot of movement and a lot of complicated processing going on with respect to our sensory organs to get the right data. That's information harvesting. Um, and the, the head movement thing is actually kind of a remarkable feature. This is some work we did a couple years ago on how vision changed after we came up on land. Our eyes got a lot bigger as we transitioned on the land. And this animal here, Tiktaalik, from 325 million years ago, is the first animal that had a, a neck that could move, so you could move your eyes and your, your head to get more sensory data. All right, so control sensing movements are really important. And here's a nice example of a human doing it. You've got a, a mask on and an odor trail that the human's trying to follow. Mask and earmuffs. <laughs> and just like any other mammal will do, you're oscillating around the uh, nominal trajectory of the odor. Uh, so what's going on here? Oh, there are the oscillations um, mapped on. What's going on there? Is it, is it is it something like, you know, one hypothesis could be if we had better actuation, if we had less noisy motor systems, we would, you know, stay on track. Or, if, or you know, so there's a number of hypotheses as to what's going on. Um, this puts us into the, well, so I'll, I'll show you some, some more sort of examples of how broad spread it is and how it's invariant to modality. So these are wiggles of a fish following a sinusoidal trajectory. It's wiggling all over the place. Here's a marine snail. Here's a chambered nautilus. Here's a rat following an odor trail. Here's a micro saccade. So these are, these are the movements, the vertical and horizontal movements. Uh, one particular measurement of an eye is doing uh, as, as it fixates. So these, these are movements at fixation. Here's a cockroach following a, a trail. Here's a, a, a mole using uh, oscillations of its nose along a, an odor trail, and here's a moth. We've all seen the casting motions of, of moths. So these oscillatory sensor-related, sensing-related movements are ubiquitous, widespread. What's going on? Well, uh, so there's been a couple of models over time, and my let me just manually go forward. Oh, let me show you one more example. That's the electric fish. Uh, this is, uh, let me wait till it goes on light here and I'll explain the situation. There, in the light, you can see it's rock steady. It's using its visual system to maintain position. You can't even tell there, that there's any slip there. 
then as you turn the lights off, it has to rely on its low resolution, there we go, on its low resolution electrosense system. And now it's doing all these body, full body wiggles. Okay, so here's the fish in blue and the trajectory in black. Lights on, perfect tracking, lights off, oscillations. Okay, so uh, lots of examples of this. There's been a lot of models, or not a lot, there's been a few models over time of how we should think about sensory acquisition movements. This is a paper from Science 2007, uh, algorithm called Infotaxis, and the argument is that animals sense so as to minimize entropy. So basically think of a distribution, a probability distribution, and the minimal, distri minimal entropy distribution is a Dirac function, it's, but you, the animal is trying to tighten up the distribution of uh, of the PDF that is representing the signal that it's trying to acquire and that would predict for this kind of heat map of signal intensity that a rat should go straight for the peak. The problem is what if you have a, this is actually a distractor and this is the target. If you do this strategy you're clearly gonna, you're basically getting trapped into a local optima and that's that was the state of the art um, as of 2007. Um, so what we have devised is a different uh, algorithm to model what animals do. We call it ergodic harvesting. And in ergodic harvesting, an animal samples a probability distribution with its trajectory where the measure of that trajectory using Fourier coefficients uh, decomposing the trajectory match the probability distribution of the energy of the signal energy. Which means that in areas of high density you sample more and, fa and slower. In areas of low density you go faster, though, so these are, ISO, these are equal time intervals between these dots. You go faster but you sample the entire distribution rather than only sampling one part of the distribution. So there's this, there's a, this is the algorithm we've devised. And we ask the question, which one does animals do? And here is electric fish tracking a refuge in strong signal conditions and weak signal conditions. Weak signal means we, we put electrical jamming stimulus that makes it really hard for them to track. And this is what they do in the weak signal condition. They wiggle a lot more. Here's what our ergodic um, harvesting algorithm does. It does relatively smooth tracking and then as you weaken the signal it does more oscillations because again it's trying to sample proportionate to the, ener to the signal energy and then the energy has gone from in the strong case kind of a sharp Gaussian to a shallow Gaussian which means you should wiggle more to sample more broadly on the shallow Gaussian representing the, the signal intensity on the, on the fish's sensory array. With odor tracking similarly this is real rat data in the strong signal condition, then they weaken the, the odor trail and you get more back and, back and forth scanning. Similarly, our ergodic harvesting algorithm pretty much reproduces that behavior. And finally, with moles, we get the same, uh, the same story. Um, and, and I should point out too, these histograms are showing the total amount of movement with respect to the total movement of the trajectory for uh, the strong signal and weak signal cases. So, in the weak signal cases, these animals are moving more uh, to, to sample the, the data better. So we wanted to ask the question, is this causal? Uh, is this wiggling actually improving performance? So what we did was we applied filters to the, uh, to the simulated fish trajectories. Let me actually skip forward to, so the original trajectory is in brown with the wiggles. And then we filter it to take out these higher frequency sidebands. So we apply a, an FIR filter, and we cut out those sidebands to progressively smooth it. And we look at what happens as a function of attenuating those, those wiggles, what happens to the relative tracking error. And here is zero attenuation to 150 dB of attenuation, and the tracking error goes from around 48% uh, to 75%. So as we attenuate the wiggles, we get decreased tracking performance. And this is uh, distance from ergodicity, which we can measure a perfectly ergodic trajectory on that, on that signal that I showed you earlier. 
If you had a perfectly ergodic trajectory, you could actually recover the distribution by decomposing the ergodic trajectory. So there's a distance from ergodicity, and if it's zero, you have perfectly ergodic trajectories. And this is showing that as you increase the distance from ergodicity, the, uh, or as you increase the attenuation, the distance from ergodicity increases. And this shows as we increase the distance from ergodicity, the mean relative tracking error increases. Okay. So summary. Ah, it's not just for this. Uh, the optimal specific wavelength, I didn't call it that, but that's what we refer to it as now, is a new example of convergent evolution with the unique feature of being quantitative. Two inwardly counterpropagating waves at the optimal specific wavelength of 20 provides linear small movement precision using nodal point control. And information harvesting in animals is ergodic. And sensory organs, including the entire body, have motor specializations for ergodic information harvesting. So going back to nodal point control, what's that about? Well, you know, with eyes, long before we came up on land, we figured out to, how to move our eyes separate from our head, which is really, really important. Uh, and that, because that gives us a low mass way of scanning our environment and wiggling our sensor. But for fish, the electric fish, it's full body. It's always full body because it's a very low resolution sense. So the nodal point control method is essentially its way of having eye movements. It's giving you those tiny little oscillations around the uh, signal energy, which gives you the ability to wiggle really rapidly to acquire better sensory information. So this is the sense in which optimal movement control and nodal point control have unified with optimal information harvesting in this animal to give you a system which can sort of both move optimally and acquire sensory data optimally. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Questions from the audience? Um, so a couple of questions. What one is um, in your nodal point control, what, what about what would be the argument for using two separate fins? So one propagating one fin propagating that way and the other one this way. In other words, why why What's the argument for having one fin where they meet in the middle as opposed to, as opposed to two fins? Yeah. Well, the, the argument is that uh, the, the, the animal's constantly uh, adjusting the position of the node where they meet from the front, all the way from the front to all the way to the back. So if I make this animal run as fast as it, has, as, as it can, essentially swim as fast as it can because there's a predator chasing it, that nodal point goes from the center all the way to the end, because now it's got to maximize its thrust. Yeah, so shifting the little point around is a major part of the um, a major part of what the the animal is benefiting from. The question from. was: um, Have you looked at um, flocking behavior over mm. birds or fish? Because there you must have a sort of multi-scale control problem. You've got to think about where you are in relation to your immediate neighbor. Yeah. But you've also got to think about what are you trying to do with a flock. Yeah, I have not. Uh, other people have, and the I, 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 a lot of people have been working on in the fish side of things. Do these um, eddies that are created by the other animals get harvested? And the initial data looked very um, negative on that, but there's some very recent work out of uh, collaboration between George Lauder and um, James Tangora at Drexel where they're using, uh, again, a robot <laughs> uh, to study this problem. And they're finding that uh, they can get quite significant energetic gains by positioning fins uh, between animals and b within, an, within a robot and phasing it correctly, that you can harvest the energy of the eddies. So it does seem to be an energetic <laughs> savings uh, method. Sensory-wise, there's also a lot of work being done on how swarms of animals are integrating sensory data in a distributed way. Um, that, so there's another active area there. Um, but I've not, it would be interesting to know if the actuation and sensing in some way combine to, to do something like we see here, which is optimize both movement and sensing at the same time. But I haven't, th that, that work has yet to be done.
has has yet to occur. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was just going, I'm sorry, I might have missed this if you said it yeah. at the beginning. I was just wondering, um, sorry, it disappeared. Oh, come on. <laughs> so all the fish uh, that you looked at with the ribbon makes yeah. it in a similar size? Yeah. And is there a transition from one form of propulsion to another based on size, based on the energetic cost? Mm. Mm. And the other thing is, has the size converged? Mm. So the first, let me see if I got the first question. Are you saying, as your need for propulsion, does do you change your fin? Or? No, no, no. Oh, sorry. It's, it's, it's more, uh, the fish that you looked at, mm -hmm. the ones with the ribbon, are they all a similar size? Oh, no. Yeah, they're very divergent in sizes, yes. So that, the ribbon mechanism comes in different sizes. Oh, yeah. So the, so some of the electric fish are like this size, and the, the, uh, the oar fish is you know, 300 centimeters along, and they all use undulatory, but they all use a specific wavelength of 20. Okay. So there is that variance there, but they use <coughs> dra drastically different size. Okay, that's quite interesting, because yeah. the ribbon form, as you mentioned, it, it seems like it's based on a, um, I guess it might be because it's a very thin structure. When you get larger fish, which are wider, then they probably use their tail more. Well, so so what happens is so uh, it turns in that video of the giant oarfish, at some point it decides it's afraid of this uh, remotely operated vehicle that's spying on it, um, and these are deep sea creatures, so they're not used to getting attention like that. So at some point it decides this is a scary thing, and instead of rippling its fin, it moves its entire body in a serpentine way. And you, gener you can generate a lot more force by using the axial musculature. These are tiny little muscles in the body that are controlling the ribbon fin. So it's not generating a lot of force. It's really for high maneuverability rather than right. speed. So when you need to book, then you use full body motion, including the electric fish. If you scare it, it does a C formation of the body, and it jets off. So does yeah. it mean like things like sharks or may not need the small... Well, it's, it's, so it's an adaptation to ne the need for high maneuverability. Right. So these things are sensing with energy that falls off with the fourth power of distance, A, and B. They're in very complex habitats, the Amazonian rivers, with tons of clutter. So when you need to be in clutter, you need a mechanical system which will give you high precision. And sensing-wise, too, fourth power with distance, it's like a whole different world, just a small distance away. Uh, so there's two reasons that you adapt this technique. But if you have open water, then corangiform swimming, other ways of swimming, give you much higher speeds over long distances. Yeah. Um, we might have time for like two more. Yeah. Um, in your experiments, you used a block wave and a sinusoid. What's the difference? Uh, a what wave in a sinusoid? Uh, uh, square, yeah. wave in a square wave in a sinusoid? Square wave, yeah. Oh, uh, just, uh, well, so, so command positions, uh, we just were challenging the system. It's probably not commonly the case that a fish needs to follow a square wave trajectory. We were just challenging it to challenging the robot to see how well it could track a square wave as opposed to a sinusoid. Because this is the movement of the ribbons, right? Oh, the, so the, the ribbon always has a sinusoid on it. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, uh, if that was a little unclear. So the, the, it's either following a square wave trajectory commanded to it or a sinusoidal trajectory, but it's always using a sinusoidal waveform on the fin. Okay. We haven't tried, if you tried to do a square wave on the fin, you'd rip the fin material. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think you got a, uh, the 10 degree from the, the magic number of 10 degrees from the robot studies. That yes. had a look and didn't matter if the fin was on the top. It was yeah. Yeah, or, yeah. Or what's, what I didn't get was what's the... the fluid and mechanical principle of that? Yes, yes. Why 10? Why not 11 or 70, yeah. 71? So, you know, it's a totally great question. And uh, so as best we can tell, so we started doing some studies as to what the optimal height to length ratio is of the fin. And uh, we're getting numbers similar in profile to what we actually see along the body, which is this... I think it's a 10 to 1 ratio of length to depth. And, it, and it's an empirical fact that when you flutter that kind of fin with a rigid top, you generate forces at two different angles. The, the heave force goes straight down, and the, per, and the other force goes at uh, um, parallel. And when you do the vector sum over that geometry, 
it just happens to be 10 degrees. This, the, it's a function of the depth of the fin. So if we made the fin deeper, it'd be a higher angle. But then the question is, well, why that depth of fin? And again, it seems to be uh, the study that we, we did and we, we have actually published. There's a, essentially an optimality in terms of what the depth of the fin is versus the length. And if you change that to either be thinner or deeper, you start to pay energetic costs. The cost of transport increases off of that opt off. So it seems, on, on your last point there, in terms mm. of the Vigoric information, asking, yeah. it seems like that has far greater implications across yeah. lots of things. Yeah. Right? And I want to pick we, up on the, yeah. the entire body thing. So for yeah. motor control, particularly with learning tasks, you'd think, well, what we want to do is, is maximize aerial propagation or aerial signals. Right? Yes. So, and it seems like that uh, our sensory systems are designed to pick up on error. Right. And so when we maximize the error, we maximize exactly. learning Exactly. Right. Yes. And so that, 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 I think what you encapsulated there is an important change in philosophy because, it, in a sense, you need to relabel that error as relative exploration effort, mm -hmm. right? Because if you call it error, it's like, well, you could be doing better. Yeah. But if, what if you're doing that because that's the best you can do, mm. right? That's a different perspective. I guess then it's interesting to think in, in a pathological case right. and suddenly these yes. internal memory predictions are suddenly screwed up yep. and we don't have good afferent efferent yeah. thing meeting in the middle. And, yeah. and, and I'm thinking in terms of stroke, for example. Well, so, so my collaborator in the ergotic information harvesting work is Todd Murphy, who works with a bunch of people at RIC, and they're applying ergotic information uh, theory to trajectories of stroke patients. And what they're finding is that these uh, actually was normals initially. I think they're about to apply it to stroke patients. And what they're finding is that these arm trajectories are ergodic with respect to the task at hand. In this case, I think it was a force field task. Um, and that error, error measures were insensitive to the change in performance across trials. But you could see that the ergodic measure was they, the, the, the trajectories of the arm were getting increasingly ergodic. So from an error perspective, error metric pr perspective, there's no improvement over trials. But in terms of ergodicity, they were clearly improving their match to the probability distribution that was being presented to, to, to the arm. So uh, that, that work is actually almost ready to be sent off. Um, and so I'd be happy to share that with you once it is out. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Cool. It's, uh, I think we're running out of time. It's like 3 o'clock now. But there are a few other questions. So maybe if you want to stick around after, yeah. ask him. But let's, um, let's thank Malcolm one more time. For that. Thank you. Thank you.